this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. So once a year, you go to the doctor, right? They take your blood pressure. Maybe they prick your finger and they take a little blood and they give you a sense of your cholesterol level. Maybe if you go to one of those fancy healthcare facilities, they get you to run on a treadmill for a while, see how your heart's doing. You get a checkup. The same thing should be true of your business. When we look at your business through the Value Builder score, we're going to look at it through eight key drivers that acquirers care about. Whether you want to sell your business immediately or in 10, 20 years from now, these are the eight factors that business buyers care about. Knowing them now will help you maximize the value of your business going forward. Just go to valuebuilder.com and take the questionnaire. My next guest, Arvid Call and Danielle Simpson, built the company from scratch up to $50,000 of recurring revenue from home, just the two of them. That's when they decided that the stress of running the company was not worth it anymore, and they decided to sell. And in this episode, you're going to hear lots of really interesting value-building strategies, the first of which is scratching your own itch, the idea of Coming up with a product that meets a need that you have is a great way to uh, start a business that you know will at least be appealing to one person, and chances are, in this case, you'll hear lots of others. Charging up front gives you the cash to build your business without taking on equity and diluting yourself. Um, Automate everything humanly possible. As Arvid talks about in this episode, he went to painstaking detail to automate virtually every element of his business. And what I love about this story is the fact that they picked a lane. They did one thing and avoided the temptation to go much broader with their product offering. Here to tell you all about it is Danielle Simpson in Arvid Call. Arvid and Danielle, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Hey, hey thanks for having us. Hi. It's great to have you guys here, all the way from Berlin, Germany. Uh, that's right. It's one of the cities that I, I, I've i got on my bucket list, but I've never been to. I've been to Germany, but I've never been to Berlin. What's it like? You should definitely come to Berlin. Yeah. yeah. It uh, There's a lot of history and a lot of artistic flair that I really appreciate. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a city of many extremes and every part of the city is completely different than the other. And there's a very interesting tech scene here as well. Lots of, lots of cool. people, lots of startups. It's really nice. How did you guys start uh, Feedback Panda? What was the, what was the impetus? <laughs> so uh, as one does as an artist, you find ways of making money on the side in between gigs. And one of my gigs was teaching English as a second language online. So um, through teaching English as a second language, I realized that these online teachers kind of had a a gap in their workflow. Um, They were going through these long processes to get some really simple tasks done. Um, And I just said to Arvid one day, as my uh, in-house software engineer, do you think we could build something here? Do you think that you could help me out? Let me understand the pain point more. So you're a teacher, you're teaching kids and and students of all kinds, uh, English as a second language. What sort of workflow things were were you struggling with? What what did you find sort of burdensome? So the way the Chinese, uh, so I was working for mostly Chinese online English teaching companies. And the, the lessons are all one-to-one. So you're teaching individual children. And after about 25 minutes of teaching, to get your full pay, you have to write a text feedback for every single child that you teach. And I was teaching um, about 24 students a day at this time. Um, and... Yeah, so that became a lot of work. So writing these reports saying, yes, Judy's you know, progressing well, she's struggling with whatever verbs. Or, and and, just and so how, does your, how did your software help? 
Well, Danielle had already built some sort of system. She had all these Excel sheets and Word documents with templates that she would use to kind of describe what happened in the lesson because essentially the curriculum was predefined by these Chinese schools. So she would teach the same lessons over and over again, just to different kids. And for every lesson, you, you know what the content is, so you don't need to type that out again. So she would have like a template like this and our system pretty much just automated that even more. Right, made it templating much easier, made it easier to retrieve information about students. That is what I built initially just for Danielle because I kind of wanted her to not spend two hours a day in unpaid overtime to write texts that she needs to get paid. So it was a, just a clear goal for me to get my partner back and spend more time with her. <laughs> and as I would say somebody who's been doing this a couple of times before building software in the SaaS world, I just build it from the beginning as something we could actually sell to people, right? Build it as a system that could have other people log in or people just log in using their social kind of media accounts, all these things. I built that from the beginning, even though it was just for her. And so where did it go from then? What types of customers or what kind of teachers did you find buying the product? So we stayed really specific in this niche. We sold to the teachers who were doing the exact same thing as I was. Um, and these are teachers working for, they're called kid English companies, these Chinese English companies um, hiring American teachers, mostly American teachers from Canada. And it sounds like a tiny market. Like how did, how big a niche. market did you imagine this to be? At the time uh, when we started in 2017, one company alone had about 10,000 teachers. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. And then there were copycats coming up every week. I think there would be a new, uh, a new school. And by the end of that year, the, that company had already doubled in size. So by December of 2017, there were 20,000 teachers. Wow. And What's your, what then, was your business model? What's the, how did you guys make money? We ran a subscription-based model. So it was um, just a monthly subscription fee. And then I think after a few months, we realized it would be smart to add in a yearly subscription plan and uh, the teachers paid on a monthly basis for access to use our software. Yeah. Why did you start the yearly plan? Um, well, we, we noticed that it, it's a much smarter choice to offer people to commit in many ways, both financially and it's kind of a validation strategy too, right? If people pay you for 12 months of the service, you kind of see that you're doing something right. And we had a lot of people upgrade. There was also, um, let's, let's call it a discount of, I think, a month. That's what we had, right? Mm -hmm. One, 110 for the yearly and 10, 10 bucks for the monthly. And that in a niche of teachers, a kind of profession that is notoriously underpaid, was also an incentive for people to stick around. The, the other thing about the yearly plan is, and the reason why we had to implement it was a lot of our American teachers, our American customers were having trouble with their credit cards working on a repeated basis with hmm. our European company. So we tried to give them a better option by allowing them to make one payment for the whole year instead of having to call their bank every month and you know, unlock that, that international payment. And how did you guys go about building your business? Like, how did you find the teachers, pitch them the software? So I was a teacher. So I knew exactly where the water cooler was, so to speak. Mm. Uh, I knew where they were hanging out, where they were exchanging uh, tricks and, and tools. That and they where were was using. that, Danielle? So mostly on social media. We had a few closed uh, groups that were... Um, kind of the hutong, actually, like the little alleys in China where people would uh, get together, the teachers would get together and, and share information. So uh, Facebook was a great starting point for us. Instagram was kind of the next step. Uh, There's a huge amount of information being shared by the teachers and teachers just have it in their bones that they want to share mm. anything that will help uh, another human being. <laughs> and were you buying, were you boosting uh, posts in those communities online or was it all organic? We, um, I think we wasted about a hundred dollars or so <laughs> trying to boost some content yeah. in the beginning, but uh, we really realized early on that just um, 
that organic content would be enough to, to spread the word. It was quite noticeable that we were actually selling to a tribe. So the, the whole community, the, the niche that we were operating in had the internal tribal structure. There was a lot of interconnectivity between the people. They all followed the same kind of people, the kind of thought leaders in their fields. And that made content marketing much more interesting than paid acquisition. Because if you put something in front of people that love to share and that have a structure in which they regularly share information, then you really just need to provide good content and it shares itself. Our whole marketing was essentially the, the offshoot of one comment that we put on a Facebook post that Danielle put there. When people asked, how do you deal with your feedback? She just essentially said, well, that's what I use. Put the link there and it really snowballed from there. And we really got into the market at a time where there weren't many other options. So once we could help teachers with this really painful problem that they had, they would immediately go back to the community and share it forward. Hmm. And talking about competitors, I, I like, I'm, st I'm struggling to imagine this was, I mean, Arvid, I think you're, you're the developer in this equation uh, was there anything proprietary about what you built or anything so unique that someone couldn't compete with you? Huh. Well, um, I, I would say from a technical perspective, no. But from the, the fact, like I just said, it, it's a tribe, it's a community, our, our customers at least. And we built something into our product that had a built-in network effect. We allowed people to share their database of templates amongst each oh, other. Smart. And that was, as a first mover in the field, that was, I, I would say, a very, very helpful thing we built. Because first off, any new user that people would bring to the platform would immediately per, like, perceive and get the value of everybody else's work. And they would then, in the future, provide more value to the whole community, to the network. So I guess the shareability of using our product was extremely high because it was a network effect product and people love to share it. So I, I think... Yeah, technically, I, it, it's not too complicated, right? It's, it's a templating system, but it's the timing and the actual feature, the focus on this feature. Really smart. And, and what's interesting is your customers didn't necessarily, I'm assuming, Danielle, correct me if I'm wrong, compete with one another in a true sense. So teachers weren't, you know, holding on to their templates, with like, you know, <laughs> not, not willing to share them. I'm assuming that most teachers are, don't see other teachers as competitors, per se. Is that fair to say, Danielle? Absolutely. And especially um, with the flood of students that were um, looking for online English instruction. I mean, the companies were really looking to find teachers and there was a shortage of teachers. So the teachers were, of course, willing to share any resources they could with each other to, to uh, help support the students as best as possible. And I think that's the, the final, like that's the end goal for all teachers is to make sure the students are being served. It sounds like the perfect, you know, almost self-managing business. Did you guys <laughs> hire a bunch of people to help you build it? I mean, you've got Arvid building the software, Danielle, you, you're obviously in, on the social sort of footprint spreading the word. I try to think of like what other tasks are there? <laughs> Probably, like, did you have employees or were there, you know, were there other people on the team? When we started, we mapped out every position that we figured our company should have so that nothing went undone or unnoticed. We ended up with about 50, 45 to 50 different positions that we thought we could fill eventually. Um, but we never hired up to the day that we sold. And um, when we did notice that there was a position that was starting to take up a little bit of time, Arvid would build uh, automation or something to, to help us kind of um, lower our amount of time in that. Specific Such a software period. engineer thing to do those yes. pesky people, get rid of them. <laughs> if, if you have to do a thing more than once, you, you don't do it manually, right? You build some sort of automation or at least a, a process around it. And, and that's what we did, right? For everything that was repeatable or repeated in the business, we would build either a very clear standard operating procedure, a process around it for ourselves to be more efficient at it, or we would build automation. Um, there, there would be things like tax advisor stuff or bookkeeping that we would outsource to professionals, the experts, both because we wouldn't be able to do it too well and because we would hate to do it. Like this kind of stuff is not entrepreneurial work. Like you don't want to 
check boxes and fill out forms. At least I don't. As an engineer, I just want to build things. And as an entrepreneur, I want to grow things. And I guess taxes are neither of these. So these kind of things we outsourced, everything else we automated. And we try to develop as little as possible ourselves, use a lot of services. Like, I guess for customer service, we'd be using Intercom and for, um, yeah, I don't know, even our database, we wouldn't manage ourselves like somebody else would manage it for us. That, that would be money we would have to pay to someone, but it was still better than having to deal with this. The cognitive overload of that for two people, since we didn't hire, would have been way too high. Um, Arvid, can you, yeah. can you give me an example of, of something that um, in a traditional business or what, you know, a, a role that you had on the org chart when you build out these 50 employees, can you give me an example of a processor or, a, or an algorithm that you built to, to avoid having to hire a person? Like, I'd be curious to know like a really tactical thing that you guys. Well, the, Danielle already hinted at it with uh, the payment problem that we ran into being a German company with a German bank account. Uh, we were using Stripe for all our um, payments, all the subscriptions, and they're great, right? They, they offer a, a lot of options and people can, can pay from any kind of country, but on the way to our bank, American banks would often block our charges because they would see, oh, this is going, this is going to be an international transaction and we better block it. So you, it would be declined. And that would be happening on the first attempt on an actual first subscription, a new member joining the feedback vendor community and on every subsequent attempt as well. So we built an automation that would detect this on our backend side from the kind of information that Stripe provided to us about the charge failing. We would formulate a message with precise information about what kind of steps they would have to do to talk to the bank, send the message through Intercom, and then pull this back into our customer service conversations that we would have with people. So essentially we built our own Dunning system to get rid of this, I guess like five to 10% of charges failing for no other reason than us being German and them being Americans. That would have been a job, I would assume, for a customer service representative or somebody who's in um, accounts receivable or stuff like that. But we kind of automated that away with a little script that was part of the whole kind of system. And we did this with all these kind of small steps or small activities that would need to be done. Just any kind of customer outreach, any kind of communication that would be done by a human, we tried to automate as much as possible. And on the other side, any kind of incoming communication, again, I'm kind of stuck with the customer service rep, but that was the, the most you, you do, at least in our kind of job. Um, you, we would have a really in-depth knowledge base with articles on every single subject. And Intercom would automatically suggest those to people who would ask a question. So they would usually answer their own questions, but just asking questions it would be automatically suggested they would solve it and it wouldn't ever even come through to us, which having a couple thousand customers near the end of owning the business would have been a lot of work for two people. And, and, and how much of your time are you spending dealing with customer service issues and, and writing these sort of these, these um, FAQs and assets that go in your intercom? So well, before Arvid built the Dunning system, I would spend two to three hours writing those messages to our customers, uh, all very um, customized to, to, each, to each customer, but sure. that alone took me three hours. So when that system was built, suddenly I had three hours in my morning to do something better with my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, we, we used the opportunities as they came. When people ask a question, that came up for the first time, but we would expect to come up again. We would just write the article right there and then and put it in the knowledge base. And if you do this every single time something new happens, eventually you will run out of new things to happen. So mm -hmm. the knowledge base just fills up and your surface of new things that comes in just decreases significantly. So I, I guess over most of the time, it would have been maybe 10, 15 actual conversations a day, no matter how many people we had, because we would always put these kind of articles into the, into the system. What was your goal in, in building Feedback Panda? I mean, uh, I guess I'd be curious to know, did you start the business with a view that you'd like to sell it? Well, I've been reading a lot of books uh, prior to founding the business with Danielle and yours is one of them. So Built to Sell has been 
fairly instrumental in my understanding of how you can build a business that you don't need to be in. And I'm a software engineer. You, you kind of like hinted at it. We don't want to do stuff multiple times, right? We try to build automations and we try to get ourselves removed from the actual work because we want to solve problems, but we don't want to solve them all the time. We want to solve them once and for all. And I felt the business should be the same. Like the business should run and then we should enjoy it, but we shouldn't be needed on every single task that comes up. So conceptually, we built the company with having it sellable and like self-running in mind, but we never really thought about selling it. So it was just like, this is how you should be building a company. And I think goals, when it comes to goals, I think the, the most ambitious goal that I had when we started the business was that one day in the far future, we would reach $50,000 MRR. That was like the, the highest number I could think of. And once we reached that, we didn't really have any goals anymore. That was- <laughs> <laughs> MRR stands for monthly recurring revenue for folks who, who maybe aren't familiar with the software space. So 50K was your bogey. That was the goal. Yeah. And what was it about that was- inspiring or motivating for you, Arvind? <laughs> well, I've been um, part of the indie hacker and indie maker scene for quite a bit. So I've been following people around and like, just checking out their successes and stuff. And in the, in the indie maker space, these high numbers rarely happen because mostly people are fairly happy in their little niche, having their lifestyle business producing 10, 20 K of monthly revenue. And that's it. Right. So seeing, five figure, like mid five figure, six figure monthly recurring revenue numbers is a rare thing. So I thought, wow, that would be cool to reach. And that was all, like, I never thought further than that. Like, obviously we could have taken this much further because like, once you grow, you just continue growing and you just, yeah, might have to change things uh, later on, but growth, if it's validated, you can continue doing that. So yeah, it was a, uh, I think that's just the, the kind of scene that I came from that these numbers were like on the upper end off. And so at 50K, what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, we just continued. Well, I, I think we, we got an email. I think that happened. Um, people started being interested in the business because um, not only did we fairly publicly, publicly communicate about the business itself, we also had Stripe verified revenue numbers on IndieHackers.com in the community. So people could follow along the trajectory of Feedback Panda but, and checking out like where we were at that point when it comes to monthly recurring revenue. And there's a lot of people that are very interested in acquiring sustainable bootstrap SaaS businesses. And these people started reaching out. So I, I think we just hit that goal. And at the same time, we kind of came up onto the radar of people who are interested in businesses like ours. For some people listening, this is very peculiar, right? That you would publicize your revenue in, on, in an, kind of an open forum. Mm -hmm. um, what, take me th through your thinking as to what, what was behind that. Why would you do that? What, what, what is the thinking behind publicizing? Your that's Stripe a, that's verified a revenue. Very interesting question. It, it is a thing I, f I feel that bootstrap founders do. At least at this point, there's a lot of people who are extremely public about their business. First off, because it's in a niche that usually is small enough not to warrant too much of competition by established players in other niches. So like if, if you're really super specific and, and there isn't too much room in the market, why would anyone build a competitor, right? That is the argument that people have internally. So they publicize their numbers, they publicize their strategies, they talk about, oh, well, I spent $500 on Facebook ads, didn't work. And, and they just are really open because it's a, it's a community of teaching each other as well. If I'm looking at the indie hacker and maker community, there's a lot of information out there. So having it out there is also some sort of encouragement for others but it also is a prestige building kind of activity. You are a successful founder if your business is verified to be successful. So everybody building their personal brand, I think that's part of it, um, can really benefit from having information like this out there. And I think there's this open data movement where companies like Buffer and I guess the guys at Transistor FM for the longest time had really, really deep insight into their subscription metrics, like actual unit 
uh, economics kind of levels where you could see like how many people were in which plan and what the churn rates were for these kind of things. It was really detailed. Most companies stopped doing this at some point, but at least general revenue numbers are very likely to be openly available in the bootstrap SaaS space. And Danielle, I mean, by training, you're an opera singer. Yes. What's your, um, what's your sense as you, as you start to evolve this business, uh, it starts to become a thing, a real thing and real revenue. And, and Arvid is, is posting these numbers to the forums. What, what, what are your feelings about this? So I never realized how many transferable skills there would be from opera to um, co-founding a business. Um, f- for me, it was all about communication um, and really developing that marketing strategy that would resonate with the teachers that we wanted to turn into customers. Um, and yeah, I think for for indie hackers, I was one of the <laughs> one of the first people to say, "Yeah, we need to be on this platform." Of course, we need to to show. Uh, how well the business is doing and and start also marketing in other directions, not only toward our customers. And I was confident that our customer base wouldn't see or be really, um, it wouldn't be the same audience in the indie hackers community as our, our teachers that we were serving. Were you Um, finding it a lot of, a lot of people find that when they get to a certain point, in in business that it becomes harder to acquire customers like it's easy to kind of cream off the the initial you know uh few customers because they have exactly the same pain point that you have but but as you kind of grow and and you guys hit fifty thousand dollars of recurring revenue um it becomes less easy did you find that danielle in your marketing that there was it was becoming more expensive to acquire each new customer no we didn't and i think that's um more a testament to how rapidly the English companies were growing Mm. because they were, they incentivized teachers to actually hire more teachers. They um, used the referral system within their own companies and incentivized teachers to, to hire colleagues. And um, this was working really well for these Chinese English companies to the point, like I said, that they doubled Mm. their numbers in 2017 and so I think we really benefited from just this hiring rush that all of these Chinese English companies were employing. And, and it did help that they were primed to be using referral systems as well. Because yes. we, right. we raised our prices a year into the business by 50%. So from 10 bucks to 15 bucks, which isn't too much, absolutely. But in relative terms, it's quite a bit. And for somebody who is under, I would say, financial duress when it comes to budgeting, like online teachers were, that was a a big increase, but we kind of softened the blow by adding a referral system that would have some kind of kickback functionality. And as these people were already so well aware of a referral system in their online school that they taught for, likely even having been recruited through a system like this and getting the benefits of it, our referral system was extremely successful too. Was it like a dual reward kind of system where both the referring and the referred teacher would get like cheaper plan or some months months for free. And that was extremely effective. And if you have a, a tribal community, a referral system will gonna is, is gonna be very, very helpful because sharing is already built in and sharing a link that both people benefit from, well that's that's a given at that point. Got it. So you guys crest fifty thousand dollars of monthly recurring revenue, and you're starting to to get some inbound interest from acquires. It sounds like. What did you think the company was worth at that point? <laughs> well, we I think uh, in those first calls we had no idea. Yeah. We really had no idea how to even really value our company at that point. Um, and regretfully, I think I, in a call with a broker in this kind of early stage before we had really chatted about, you know, do we want to sell? And if we want to sell, how, what for? When that conversation really became real, when I had that conversation with the broker, I think we just pulled a number out of thin air and uh, maybe alienated a few buyers that might have been interested in us had we had that conversation a little bit sooner. 
What what number did you pull out of the air? You pulled like a, a number that was totally un- unreasonable, or what, what did you say? What like what did you say? It, it was a fairly high number. Like, quite at the risk of uh, adding any speculation um, to what the final number was, I, I am reluctant to say what our initial uh, really lofty number was. Even it was very ambitious and a, a bit too ambitious, I guess. And the kind of only deals that were on the table with that number in mind were something including an earnout to to actually get that full value. So I guess it wasn't so lofty that people weren't <laughs> engaging in the conversation with us, but but still um, not the kind of deal that we wanted. As as you as you got into it a little bit more and got more educated about it, what what did you start to? Uh, what did you start to think the company might be worth? Like, did, were you able to triangulate around a, a kind of a, a standard multiple or any sort of uh, benchmarks that you thought were reasonable? Like, like a range is fine. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a um, it was always a, a seven figure thing in our mind, but um, we we really didn't know how to value it easily because if you have a multiple and there's a lot of multiples floating around. Um, particularly in in SaaS, it really, really depends. Like obviously there, it it could start with a a sub one multiple and it could go up to 20, 40, whatever, depending on the niche you're in. And since nobody really knows what uh, the value of a company is until you start valuing it, it it was, it was completely arbitrary for us to, to pick a number. And we never really um, wrote anything down. I think we never had any, actual number in mind we just we always went with the range i think we always went with the range and we also took a lot of care to look into the terms of the deal not just the number i mean the number is extremely important when it comes to selling a business and then reaching some level of financial security and stability that you didn't have before obviously but you don't want to be bound to a five-year earnout. You don't want to be bound to these weird goals that are unreachable, that are part of the deal, or you don't want, if, if you had employees and we had, we didn't have employees, but we had contractors working for us on stuff like writing blog posts and stuff. We wanted to know that they would also be part of the team if it were to transition. And these kind of things were important to us at least as much as the final number. How much are you guys clearing at the end of a month? Because $55,000 of MRR, I mean, clearly you had some servers, you had these contractors, but I'm guessing a, a big chunk of that's falling to the bottom line. Yeah, well, our salary, I guess, was uh, like it always is the, the, the most. If you remove that, I think... Um, if I can give you a range, like somewhere between five and fifteen ish percent of uh, of what came in was expenses or was to be expenses. So we we had a fairly high margin, as is often like that. In, yeah, in SaaS, very right? normal in SaaS to have very high margins. And, mm. and only really what we paid to ourselves as a salary instead of dividends, because we just wanted to have that. Um, that was the, the biggest cost. But once you remove that, um, it, it's looking very interesting. And even before it looked very interesting, obviously. But, and that's the thing with multiples and with EBITDA and, and revenue and all these kinds of things. It really depends on what you take and what you don't take, right? When it comes to mm-hmm. this kind of factorization like, uh, of factors uh, that go in and out there. Yeah. But as you had conversations, did, was it your understanding that buyers were we're using a multiple of revenue to value your company or more a multiple of there's a, as an acronym called SDE, which floats around among business brokers, sellers, discretionary earnings, which includes your mm-hmm. salary. Did, did you hear multiples of SDE or multiples of revenue? What was more common? So they were both there. They just, whichever, um, figure was more interesting to the seller, Mm -hmm. I guess, and and what they were more used to dealing with or what, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what um, set our company apart for them to then choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know we definitely, there were a few, um, I mean, even SureSwift who ended up acquiring uh, uh, Feedback Panda, they have a great blog post on how they 
personally value companies. And, oh, how's that? Um, I could direct you to the, to the blog yeah. post. Yeah. Definitely. We can it's, put it in the show notes for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's um, they have some really great content there for, um, for sellers and uh, FE international as well has some, some good content around how you can value your SaaS. And I think that they even, they would even give you a free valuation, um, you know, if you get in contact with them. Right, right. So, I mean, in, in a, I know we can't disclose the actual sale price. As you started to get into these conversations with uh, potential acquirers, um, like I'm, I'm used to seeing for companies that are sort of below um, three or four million dollars of, of annual recurring revenue, multiples in the kind of one to two times revenue like are we are we kind of talking in that range or can can we i guess that would again, be we don't the, have to the lower lower end of the band like um particularly in in saas um that has high margins is completely automatable and you can run it with two people you're looking at different numbers because there's higher than that yeah much much higher because you don't really like if if you are a company like SureSwift that has a trained team of people that are already running 30 something saas businesses that are just like this one adding another one has very little marginal cost for them. And if the business then itself has high margins and low work because everything's automated, that is a very interesting perspective. So mm-hmm. yeah, in, in, in this kind of automated low touch company and low touch business in a niche that is still growing, that there was no plateau in sight and uh, on, on the customer side and in our business as, as well, you have a, a pretty good outlook. Higher than one to two. Yeah. And so how, where does it go from there? So where you're, you're sort of fielding these inbound requests. Um, what, what was your next step? I guess we had to decide if we wanted to sell or not because <laughs> we really didn't have the conversation before. We, we built a company to sell, but never with the intent to sell, right? We made it sellable, but we, we never wanted to, to actually be acquired until we were. And I, I think that there, a lot went into that. So I, I think a lot went into the decision to think about selling. Two people can run a company pretty well, but it kind of drains you at some point. At least that's my own personal experience, particularly from the technical point of view, because the more customers you have in a business, if you're the only person that can solve their problems, should there be an emergency, both on, oh, I deleted all my data, which is the lowest level to, oh, the database just died, which is your whole business pretty much um, crashing to a halt, then that puts a lot of pressure on you as, a, as an engineer. And I developed severe anxieties during the time in Feedback Panda, which I dealt with. And I guess you can deal with stress in many, many ways, and I did. But you kind of think, okay, what do I do? And since hiring for me, for some weird reason that I've yet to come to understand was out of the question, because I thought, ah, I can deal with this, it's all gonna be fine, which it wasn't, but you know, the mind. I. I thought, okay, well, now that we are at this point, everything's automated, I only really have to get up for emergencies. Can we hand this to somebody else to take this and receive the value that we've created? That was my personal perspective. How how about you at that moment? I... I could see how it was, uh, how the stress of the company was affecting Arvid, definitely. And I was looking forward to, um, yeah, I, I wanted to support you in, in that decision for sure. It, it sounds interesting because on, on some level, it sounds like the perfect business. I mean, you've got <laughs> this little protected niche, it's growing like stink, there's no advertising costs. I mean, it's, it's growing. Arvid, you've documented everything so that you don't have to deal with it. Like you've got the knowledge center. What was so stressful about it? <laughs> well, if, if I had to do it again, or if I were to do it again, which I likely might, I would just hire. I think the responsibility of dealing with things that come up, these kind of interruptive things, that is just an anxiety-inducing potential. It doesn't even have to happen. 
right? The, the fact that we were integrating with a lot of, of these schools, these online schools, and we integrated into their classrooms, which were web-based, and they had all these things that we would integrate with just to make our customers' lives easier. And then an integration would break. But it wouldn't break at like 2 p.m. when you just came back from dinner or from, from lunch. It would break whenever, and you would have a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand customers yell at you through Intercom. That's just the reality for, for solo founders or for like people that are just a two-person team. Something happens and everything yells at you. And that's, that's, that's just what it is. Your alarms go off, the people reach out, and the idea of this happening was inducing more anxiety in me than the actual thing when it happened. Mm. Because when it does, as a, I guess, a trained engineer, you just like go at it, right? You solve the problem, you fix it, you apologize, and then it is over. But waiting for this to happen one more time, I think that kind of anxiety uh, in me at least, that made me want to find a way to deal with this without it being my, my own job. And I, I still don't really know why I didn't want to hire because as we sold the company, obviously we needed to replace ourselves, right? We needed to find somebody who would do our job in, in the new company. And so we, we assisted with finding somebody and train them as you have to do. And there I learned that hiring is absolutely not scary at all, but it just had never hired before. That's one of these things. I've been going through my life as an engineer, always being hired, but never hiring. And now that I've done this, yeah. No problem. Next time, I'm just going to hire a guy to, to take care of this. And so I can sleep. It's just uh, when, when you wake up and you have 400 intercom messages on your phone, that is the kind of stuff you don't want to do every single day. So yeah, that, I guess uh, that would be it, right? Yeah. And I think that we could have, um, one of the key learnings that I've had is uh, along with these goals that we made, you know, that 50K lot number that we thought, oh, it's going to take us so long to reach that number. We'll, we'll have time to figure out what to do when we get there. <laughs> But we didn't make um, strategic goals along the way to say, okay, when we get to this number, this is when we have to bring new people on our team. Um, we just, we got to 50K MRR so fast that we didn't um, have the systems in place to kind of deal, deal with the, the kind of fear that actually comes with, okay, now I actually feel I have something to lose. Mm -hmm. I'm not making smart business decisions anymore. I'm making decisions based on, I have to put out a fire and I don't want to lose what we've built. So um, having those more strategic goals in place along the way, I think could have... Uh, could have made it the company that yeah. we did never want to stop. Absolutely. Get, let's get into the transaction itself. So you, you're fielding these inbound requests. Um, did you get to like letters of intent from a group of people? Did they, did you hire an advisor to sort of help you sell the company? What was the next step? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we got those and we hired uh, advisors. Um, we, um, I had a lot of communication, informal at first, and then when, when it came to the, the more formal parts, the, the letter of intent, and this, this kind of actually looking into the project, like handing out read-only um, invitations to our metrics tools that would show people inside like bear metrics or profit well, these kind mm -hmm. of um, SaaS metrics analysis tools. And we had been so transparent with our metrics beforehand that there wasn't too much left to really show actually. Yeah, I think our P&L was not a surprise. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, people looked into our business and they saw a thing that they could already kind of see by just looking at, a, at the information that was already available. How many letters of intent did you receive? The, a number. <laughs> A few. I think can, you, the, can you be a little more specific? Like, are we talking like dozens, less than five? <laughs> yeah, I mean, less than five. Yeah, it would be less than five. But I, I wanted to get back to your, to your question about advisors. Yeah. For, we, we did talk to a number of brokers who were initially working for potential acquirers. Um, and we um, looked into maybe having one work for us, but... In the end, I'm a person that likes to get down to the lowest common denominator. And I felt like the, the less people in the room, the more clarity mm -hmm. we would have and just go with, uh, we ended up um, having one lawyer that we worked closely with and he kind of advised us through the, the acquisition. Again, I know we can't talk specifically about the acquisition price, but I would love to know, you got multiple offers. 
like, could you give me a broad stroke range? What the difference between them were? Were they kind of around the same number or were they wildly different? They were around the same number, but a few of them really were requiring a lot more different factors. Like, Such as? Um, you know, when we hit a lot of the, the final number was, it was an earnout. In the most simplest terms, it, it was an earnout kind of structure, which um, although I would have loved to continue working with Feedback Panda, I didn't want it to be tied to um, anything of the valuation of, of what the company was. Yeah, goals that you would have to reach but had less control over compared to what you had before when you had the, the full company at your disposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was, it was just about like, the difference of obligations, I think, that, that made, uh, made a big difference for us as well. And it was so wonderful, so comforting, actually, and gave us a lot of confidence in SureSwift. When our lawyer looked at theirs, he was saying, wow, I can't believe how straightforward and um, yeah, how said, straightforward this could be. I think be. He's, he said he's never seen such a boring contract. <laughs> <laughs> that that was uh, with the letter of intent and the the actual agreement that we had. Like he was surprised by how little work he had to do because it was really straightforward. Which is a thing I guess that Shurtsworth prides themselves on because they, they just do the same thing over and over. They acquire SaaS businesses like ours, so they have built this system right, that works for them and works for the businesses. So it's not what, a big surprise. What were the terms? We can't talk about can't that, really unfortunately. Talk about the terms, yeah. So the, could you talk briefly broad strokes? Like it, it was a simple thing. So they, so it had obviously like the price that they were willing to pay, which is, which is something we can't necessarily reveal. Mm -hmm. um, Some transition time and then okay. essentially transitioning out of the company completely. So we hired our replacements and taught everyone to, to run the company as we did. Yeah. And to be clear, was that a requirement in order to close the transaction? In, in other words, did, did you have to hire your replacement before the deal could go through or was the deal going through and as just part of your obligation was to? Yes, the latter. It was the latter, okay. Um, yeah, and was I, I guess that's, that's like the confidence that they had in their own team to be able to take it up. And obviously having cited our documentation and automation protocols and the processes we had, they were quite confident that they could do it. So that, that's why it wasn't like, they, they still like customize, I guess, the, the contracts, but in, in our case, it was all done, well, mostly, mostly all done when uh, we actually signed it. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Where were you when the deal actually became firm? In this very room. Yeah, we were at home, um, right? Yes. Yeah, we, we were yeah. always at home because we were working from home as well, right? That, that was one of the, the great things about Feedback Panda is that we could take the company being a SaaS business to wherever we were, both here in Berlin and whenever we would visit Danielle's family over in, in Canada, we would just take our laptops and the company would travel with us. So everything we did uh, when it came to the acquisition was also done from home. And it was a, a very interesting process, I guess, like just to this signing the documents in a, in a digital form, just like sending over emails and, and just signing on, on your screen or on a trackpad or something. It is a, a weird modern way, I guess, to sell, uh, let's call it a weird modern company. It was, it was a great feeling and I guess uh, both actually signing the contract and then of course receiving um, the compensation. That was uh, definitely one of those things. You don't really know how you feel uh, before you actually do. It was great, but it also, in all honesty, it didn't change your life at that moment, right? Obviously you still have to continue working in the business and you still have to make sure that everything goes through and you kind of are still attached to the business. And I, I guess we could talk about that, like the, the change in what you actually have to do once this happens. But the moment itself, for me at least, was great, but um, didn't, I, I didn't feel different. Yeah, kind of in a, in a wonderful way, it was kind of... Um... I mean, I'm an opera singer, of course, I'm, I'm waiting for the high note or the big explosion at the end that says, okay, it's over, but, or the timpanies or whatever. But, um, but yeah, it was really just a smooth 
process there was no explosion thank thank goodness it was quite uh yeah in the best way possible very anticlimactic that's right how has it changed you now that some water's under the bridge some time's gone by well i i think we both had a fairly hard time um actually understanding that our work at feedback panda was over at that point um, because the company we sold to, they were very proficient at taking it over. So we were out almost immediately, but just had to, like, again, hire our replacements, train them a bit. But with the documents that were already in place, they could essentially train themselves. I think one of the things I did, because I, I had so much time and I wanted to prepare, I, I took like an 11 hour video walkthrough through the code base of Feedback Panda, where I would just explain <laughs> to myself at that point, and I guess the future developer, how everything worked, like every single line of code. That was fun, but it also meant that I didn't have to train them, right? I, they could just take the developer on and give, give them access to this document and they could train themselves. So I was in a void. I didn't know what to do. Here, here I was 24 hours, just uh, every single day trying to help people and fix and build things. And now I was just sitting there. So the first thing I did was started writing, writing down my, my experiences because I had this head full of stuff that I didn't know what to do with, um, which I turned into a blog and uh, now a podcast as well, because I really want to get it out, this kind of experience that I've been um, having over both the two years that we ran Feedback Panda, almost two years, and all the startups that failed that I was part of before, all these kind of things just, I had time to reflect. So that was great. And I used that time because I had nothing else to do to really pour it on the page. That was at least what I did. Mm-hmm. Danielle? And I think um, I kind of expected a transition to happen overnight, which is just not the case. The the transition doesn't, or you don't become a different person when suddenly there's a large amount of money in your bank account mm-hmm. and it just doesn't work that way. Um, but what did happen immediately was um, I wasn't always thinking about Feedback Panda in the back of my mind. When I was present with someone, family, with Arvid going to a show, um, I could be in the theater and not have to worry about are there, you know, 50 messages from intercom that are going to be greeting me when I turn my phone back on. Mm -hmm. Um, Just this kind of presence that I now have again, where I'm not constantly thinking about Feedback Panda is uh, something I'm really appreciating and enjoying at this point. Is it the kind of serenity that would would cause you to second guess the decision to get back into the startup world? Is, is that sense of freedom uh, enough that you wouldn't no. do it again? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Like I am totally ready to just jump right back in any day yeah. um, and, and start something. Why? You've got enough you money. You could live off the money. You could sing opera and travel um, Italy. Like what? This why, was one why? of the, the major uh, Things that we uncovered, I guess, when we discussed if we really wanted to sell was noticing this kind of fear, fear that creeped into our decision making. Um, it was about security. Mm-hmm. We did start the company and I was working these crazy hours to try to pay off my student loan, which we, you know, we reached that goal and, and successfully paid off my student loan. That was a, a great goal. But um, what we really wanted to reach with this sale is this kind of post-economic state of mind where we could throw ourselves into another project and um, not be making decisions based on what's financially secure, but what's making sense, what the world needs, what we want to say. I'm a creative, so it has to be uh, something, <laughs> something that's really coming from a need to express it and share it with the world. Beyond paying off the student debt, did you buy yourself any trophies? We had a very nice vacation. We went to South Africa. Oh, fun. For 10 days. Yeah, that was really cool. Good for but you. No, That's n- nothing else. I, I think the, the trophy that we both rewarded us with was actually investing the money into what it turns out to be like passive income streams. Like turning, it's a boring answer, and I'm quite aware of that. But <laughs> I was hoping for Ferrari. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, who knows, right? <laughs> what the future brings. But it I was think, a very nice vacation. Yeah, it was a really nice <laughs> vacation, and I think being financially 
stable is a reward that is eclipsing uh, most material goods. What sort of, that's my perspective. What sort of passive investments did you make? Well, mostly stocks, I would say. And then there's other things that if you are in the SaaS entrepreneur scene that are open to you investment-wise. And- also, investing in ourselves, taking time to read yeah. and, and bring up skills and, and things that I might have wished I had skills in before we started Feedback Panda. Yeah. Um, and then also just you need some time to, um, yeah, I've got other projects already starting. So uh, just Great. having the freedom and the time to, to uh, start those. Where can people reach out? If uh, It's an amazing story. I'm sure there'll be people that want to check in with you guys. What's the best place? Do you want to send them to a website or? Sure. Well, I'm reachable on Twitter and Instagram under the same handle. It's at Simpson Danny, D-A-N-I-K. Uh, and it's the same on both channels. Yeah, and you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at Arvid Kahl, A-R-V-I-D-K-E-H-L. And my blog is thebootstrapfounder.com, where I have, obviously, I release an article every week, and I have a podcast there and a newsletter as well. So if people are interested in the, both the technical and the entrepreneurial perspective, that's where they can find me. Well, that's awesome. Arvid, Danielle, thanks for doing this. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.